Diary, hello. It is February 2022, and today we're going to look up, look at the startup of the Kremenko Unix computer, which, as I shall explain, is a very rare beast. But first, let me try and see if I can get to the uh, camera side so I can see what you can see of me. Right, there we are. That's better. Um, so, what you see in front of you is hopefully a picture of the Kremenko, my Kremenko named SIS00. And if you're a Kremenko person, you'll know that this is not a Kremenko chassis. So, I thought I'd just first of all uh, tell you the history of this system because it's quite interesting. Um, Kremenko, for a long time, produced Z80 computers. Uh, they then switched to this Motorola 68000, but they still ran their own proprietary operating system, which was quite famous at the time, and it was called Chromix. They didn't, in any shape or form, use uh, Unix. Um, but for a number of, I believe, re regulatory requirements, for example, for a big aircraft contract, they were required to run Unix. So I believe that they began to think about supplying, quote, real Unix uh, because of such large contracts. And as such, I was fortunate enough, whilst living outside of the USA, to hear about the sale of one or more Kremenko late uh, systems which ran Unix. So I was quite excited, and in fact, I actually uh, bid and won an eBay auction. Uh, and and uh, rather than having the goods shipped overseas, I decided I'd get on a plane. So uh, I bought a plane ticket and my partner and I journeyed over to America to pick up the system. So the system was massive uh, and in a massive Z2 star chassis, which is a much bigger chassis than the one you see in front of you. So we couldn't easily bring that back on the plane. So we literally had the system delivered to a friend's house uh, near where I used to live in North Carolina. And uh, we visited him at the end of a, a brief holiday, all too brief holiday. And uh, we took the system apart. So we just literally took all the cards, the hard drive, and we left the uh, Z2 chassis with instructions for it to be taken to the tip, which is uh, sacrilege really. Uh, but there you go. So what you see in front of you is now the working system of cards, which I'm going to show you in a second, placed into this, I think it's an Intergrand chassis. Uh, so let's start with the picture of the system as it was uh, when it was in Switzerland. So that was the picture when I was living in Switzerland. So you can see it had a real hard drive, a real tape drive, uh, and a a, floppy, a small floppy drive which was emulating an 8-inch uh, an floppy drive and a, a, a drive at the... Uh, oh, you can't see that. A drive at the back... Let's show you that. A drive at the back was a 5 and a quarter inch floppy drive. So it had two physical floppy drives, uh, a tape drive and an, uh, an MFM hard drive which was attached to the ST disk controller. So let's look at the next slide. So the uh, Irfan View program that I've used for probably, I think about 20 years, just keeps changing the uh, the resolution. So here's a picture in Switzerland with the system sort of in the middle of its uh, rejigging, shall we say. So I've managed to take out the uh, the tape drive. I mean, fitting all of this into this chassis is remarkable. The the uh, the original uh, system that I got in the USA was you know twice this size and was much more capacious shall we say uh, let's continue the, uh, the the slideshow okay so we're now looking inside the system so uh, you can oh, I think there's another let's, let's go to the next slide yeah that's the best slide let's let's look at this so now we're looking inside the system as is today so the modifications that have been made are the following. This is the original power supply here, which supplies the S100 bus cards. This is my modification, which is that I've managed to cram in a PC power supply. So 
all the 5 and 12 volt rails of any peripherals such as these disk drives here are from this PSU because I figured that the uh, the hard drives might take quite a lot of power if it's a real hard drive and I don't want it to blow this rather ancient power supply here particularly because this guy supplies I think it 18 volts to one of these uh, rails and of course that's not an easy an easy voltage to obtain but this this I want this circuit to last as long as possible so anyway the idea is to to help that along by taking the 5 and 12 volt rails of uh, significant power from a separate power supply so that's what that PC power supply is doing in there then if we look up here you'll see that this card here is actually the the uh, now this is the XXU card. This is not my handwriting. This is uh, handwriting from the, the Kromenko factory, believe it or not. So I didn't write that down. So that's the infamous uh, XXU processor card. And that's got a, a Motorola 68020 on it. So the story is that when Kromenko originally released their computers, they famously ran on Z80, Z80 processors, which then got upgraded to a processor card called the DPU, then the XPU, which were combined um, Motorola um, and Zilog processors. So essentially the startup of the machine could still be using the Z80 code base that they, they'd had for, for all those years. But uh, when they moved to the uh, X, XU card, that was all thrown away. And this only had a Motorola 68020 processor on it. And furthermore, since Unix, as opposed to Chromix, wanted memory ma hardware memory management, they actually had an XMU card here. So this card here is the XMU card to match the XXU card. And that provides hardware memory management. So in other words, the CPU looks for a certain address and it's translated by this card to a different address. Uh, then we have these two cards here, which are the memory cards and there's a memory controller card. Uh, this is all dynamic, not static memory. So in other words, if the power is uh, removed, the, it has to be continually refreshed to keep, keep its contents. Then we've got some various other cards in here. Uh, one of the main cards here is the this card here is the uh, STDC hard disk controller and that goes via a ribbon cable so th these ribbon cables here these multicolored ribbon cables uh, feed a hard disk so today they feed a hard disk emulation card which sits in here so uh, earlier on in Switzerland I actually had a physical hard drive here but those hard drives are increasingly hard to find uh, in, a, in a working condition so the, uh, there is one or two products only on the market and I've uh, snapped up David's product here which emulates two MFM hard drives. So that's running up its own Linux computer, you're going to see all of that in a second. Uh, and more, more worthiness is coming along. Let me just show some of the other components here. Right, so... Uh, in the old de olden days, you'd have a processor card which had a, both a Zilog Z80 and a Motorola processor card on it. But, as I've said, when it came to the 68020 card, that wasn't possible. Now, most of the applications that were around ran under CPM, which is an 8-bit uh, operating system. And so the question was, how would you run those, those applications? And the answer was to run a, an I.O. processor card which still had a Z80 on it. Uh, and Kremenko were incredibly clever because they had various ways of doing that. So they had some communications cards, and this is an example of an eight port serial card, which had a Z80 processor on it and 64K of memory. Um, so you could use this card as an eight port serial card, or amazingly, you could use it as a satellite processor. So that's how it's installed in this system it's used as a satellite processor uh, so I can run on this 32-bit system the 8-bit uh, Z80 processor on this system here and not use it uh, as a if you use it as a a uh, 
a, a, a CPM or, or a Z80 CDOS uh, execution host. You can't use it as a serial card, but nevertheless, it's in there. And in fact, that's pretty handy because I found out that the um, this the screen editor doesn't work. When I run the screen editor, it crashes. So actually, in this system, I have to use an 8-bit program to run the screen editor, otherwise I can't really get anywhere. So luckily, I, I've eventually got that working. Uh, and uh, in, in the process of getting that working, I had to set these dip switches in a very strange fashion. Uh, so we've come across the uh, the background. Oh, there's there's a position of the dip switches. Uh, oh, there's some more uh, position of the dip switches. So I'm using. I don't know if you can see that. Let's just zoom back out there. That's the uh, using this as a, a satellite processor called the ZIO. Okay, so I think we're done with the waffle. Uh, now it might be time to actually do a bit of work. So I'm going to start a putty session and bring it on screen. Uh, I need to get to zero. That's com port twelve. Okay, so in the window now is com port twelve running at ninety six hundred baud serial. So out of my workstation is a US. Uh, B cable going to a USB to serial interface. That serial interface then goes into the back of the 64FDX. That's the sort of go faster version of the 64FDC floppy disk controller. And that's got a serial port on it. And the, the convention has always been for Kromenko systems that um, the processor card doesn't have a serial port on it as opposed to some other systems like Godbout, where they, there was a serial port. Uh, the processor card just is a CPU or dual CPU. And the floppy disk controller has got a serial port on it. In addition, you could add extra serial ports using something like the Octart or QDart card. But in this case, the Octart is being used as a satellite Z80 processor. Are you with me? Right. So we've got the... Connection from my workstation down the USB cable to a serial converter into the back of the floppy disk controller card. When I power on the computer, uh, this is one of the latest uh, issues of the Kromenko hardware. It's automatically going to try and boot. And I will pause that boot for a moment and then I'll do a manual boot. There we go. Press the on switch. Putting on. We're exciting. Uh, oh, let's get it. Right, so the semicolon prompt has been shown. So it's running something called DDoS, which um, when all other Kromenko systems, apart from this, this generation, the, le the last generation, if you like, uh, ran something called RDOS, the Resident Disk Operating System. And I was expecting this to actually have a ROM on the processor card uh, called XDOS. But to my surprise, the prompt comes up with DDoS. But I think DDoS is XDOS. I think there's I don't know, some mix up of the factory, or I don't know what the difference is, but DDoS effectively is XDOS, which is a 32 or 64 kilobyte program written in Motorola 68K. And that has a limited number of functions to enable you to boot the system to either a floppy disk or a hard disk. Um, now, this, as you can see, it says preparing to boot STD31, uh, type escape for prompt. Now, I'm going to try and explain that a little bit more with a diagram. Diagram, where are we? Where are we? Don't let me down. Right, so again, uh, a lot of this, a lot of these resources are available on the uh, Kromenko GitHub, and I, I would hope that Kromenko enthusiasts would be subscribing to same. So look, here is the drive which we are going to boot from, and I've got the partition table of the drive laid out in front of you to show you the partitions just in text. Um, so this actually was a, a MIT, oh, spelling mistake, MIT. Subishi 
MR535 hard drive when it was new. Um, there's the partition 0 and this contains the Unix operating system. Partition, counting from 0, partition 1, which is 4 megabytes in size, contains the swap. And good old partition 2 contains the Kromenko Chromix operating system, which is the you know the their native product, if you like. Um, and there's a there's a, a third partition which is reserved for whatever you want to do with it, say applications. So we're going to boot into this 30 megabyte partition, and believe me, that is quite a big space considering the time. So let's just save that file. We're now now when we're, we're going to boot into what we need to do is to boot the in, boot into the bootstrap and instead of actually boot so you might think that this is partition 0 and the b is the boot command you might think me typing bst0 to boot to partition 0 but actually you need to actually boot to the whole of the hard drive into a, into a hidden place so you have to type in to boot to partition 31 but 31 needs to be entered in hex so we actually need to say boot to the stdc disk and translate 31 into hex you need to be 1f there you go so boot the st stdc disk partition number 1f and 1f is 31 in in decimal ah that's not going to work so the, the disk controller's not started so let me just press escape sorry messed up messed up so hey i wanted i wanted to show you the what I've done is I've start, I wanted to start from scratch so you can understand everything. So the hard disk controller is talking to the simulated hard drive, and that is a Linux. Sorry, it's a yeah, it's running a, a Linux operating system, quite an old release, and uh, it's it's separately running on this Linux computer in front of you. Again, so on this Linux computer, I can just putty to it via an IP address and I'm going to start the hard drive here. I've got a convention saying that's disk number two with 977 uh, cylinders and five heads and some sort of text reminder message. That tells me that that's the Unix 5.2 hard drive and it's going to be shown as drive one, not drive two. So let's go for that. Right, so that's powered up the simulated hard drive so now, do apologise, we're going to boot the STDC, the STDC disk, via the STDC disk control, we're going to boot the Seagate drive partition 1F. It's going to work. Oh, I can see the activity. Well, it's quite exciting. Look, here's the activity of the of the of the actual disk controller here. I'll put that in the in the background, so you can see the actual disk activity. Wow! Here we go. Created May the third, nineteen eighty nine. Look at all of this. Fantastic. We're up. So uh, I'm making a few commands wrong here because I'm obviously jumping between Linux and uh, Unix. PS minus EF. Yes. So we can see that the, the that Unix is up. Not many things running. Less minus L of the root directory. Shows what it shows. And that's as far as I'm going to go. We're going to shut the system down. Uh, you can see there's all this hard drive activity here. So this is the emulated hard drive which is being commanded via the system here. So I need to be in the root for the shutdown of this Unix and I can say shutdown zero. Okay, that's complete. So I hope you you enjoyed the video. Uh, we showed you the Kromenko 
uh, Unix system booting, uh, Unix was really, really rare for Kremenko users. If you ask a Kremenko user, you know, how long did they use Unix? They said, they'll probably say, oh, I never realized that Kremenko had Unix. We, we thought they only had Chromix or CDOS. Um, it, it's, it's the last generation. It was used, uh, I think, for, uh, to satisfy uh, big military bids that they won. Um, and it sits on this uh, elite hardware, the X range of hardware. So you've got the 64 FD, FDX floppy disk controller. You've got the XX. Uh, U, CPU, etc. Okay, Dari, thanks for watching.